The Hurling Show, brought to you in association with Torpy. Torpy are leading hurling into a new future with Bamboo, a revolutionary hurley created using their unique engineered hurling performance know-how. Already being used by many inter-county players, Torpy's Bamboo is highly sustainable, offers players greater striking distance and a more consistent balance every time, without compromising on natural feel. Check them out on the Torpy website and in the link below and enter the promo code RGAME to get yourself 10% off. It's a sad day, Michael Verney. It's a very sad day. But you know what we're going to start it off with? I'm sure people out there are seeing the news that Brendan Maher has retired from Tipperary after 13 great seasons. But there's only one way to, to lead a tribute out, and that's with this thing up on screen here. Huh? <laughs> no better man. Isn't, isn't it funny, though, that like for a guy who's won three senior All-Irelands with Tipperary and three other ones at underage, that it's actually nearly the run with Boris Salih that stands out more than anything. That's a fact, yeah. Well, can you hear that noise in the background? No. Dong, dong, da dong, dong, da dong, 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 dong. A sad day in Bursa Lee and a sad day for Tipperary folk, but uh, you know, a day that should be kind of celebrated as well because by Jays like Brennan Matter had some career, some consistent career uh, throughout that 13 years. And it's funny, as you say, the, the club run with Bursa Lee, I, I always think. Club runs like that can help cement a player's greatness. And having come back from the cruise ship that year and been absolutely unbelievable with Tip, you know, their designated man marker, he follows that on with this crazy run. Uh, you were at you were at all the games. I wasn't at all their games, but it was at the, the Munster final, which was just unbelievable. Remember that when that ball flicked up and all of a sudden Brendan Matter comes in from out of the screen and puts the ball over the bar. That's in the Munster final. And then he does he goes one better in that all Ireland semi-final, hitting a free and then scoring a pint with a with a broad broken hurdle and then retrieving the broken hurdle uh, in a roundabout way a couple of weeks after. Just, uh, yeah, an unbelievable player. Probably versatility, what I'd say, was probably one of his strongest points in that he could play anywhere across the back line, midfield. And like if you wanted to, he could easily drift into half forward, absolutely no issue. And uh, the one thing I'd say as well is, uh, you know, always had a big profile within the GA, but always carried that as I think you should carry you know, that kind of responsibility and profile never changed one bit, was always unbelievably easy to deal with. Uh, there was absolutely no ego with Brendan Matter whatsoever. And I think uh, I think that's why he was, he'd was he be loved for what he did on the pitch, but he'd be loved, if not more, for what he did off the pitch, I'd say, as well. Yeah, even though his nickname down home is, uh, you'd hear plenty of people refer to him as Kaiser, which is a, a nice little nickname to have. But yeah, always very, very easy to deal with. And uh just a brilliant player for Tip. Even played in the full back line at times. Do you remember Mark and Aaron Galan in the Munster final 2019 and when Tip were under massive pressure, did very well that day. I think overall, should have been named Hurler of the Year in 2010. He got the Young Hurler of the Year award and Lars scoring the hat-trick in the All-Ireland final. That was decisive. That's the sort of thing that uh, regularly happens when someone gets that highlight reel stuff. But he was my Hurler of the Year in 2010. Obviously, you'll say a bias there. That's fine. Absolutely accept that. But, I mean, look at the impact when he wasn't starting. The one time he was left out of the team was 2011, obviously broke his foot, wasn't brought back into the team. And, you know, it cost Tipperary for a finish. So uh, I even think around 2013, when Tipperary were all at sea and, you know, just not having a great season, that that was arguably one of his best seasons. Like, he was really good. That game down in Nolan Park, thought he had a given an exhibition that day when Tipperary were under pressure and just weren't weren't going well. But, you know, I, I knew that... I mean, everyone in Burris Lee knew that this lad was coming. I, I played underage with his brother, Martin, and he was a very good hurler. And then when, when Brendan came along, I think everyone kind of knew it was well signposted that this lad was, you know, unless things went the wrong way, he was going to be playing for Tipperary. And, you know, I think he's uh, he, he's one of, you know, a few lads from Burris Lee have now cap captained uh, the county to an All-Ireland title. And I think it's no shock that he ended up doing it just because from the get-go when he stepped into the senior team with Burris Lee, you were like, ah, yeah, he's to the manor born here. I assume um, you would have had dealings with him club-wise back in your Burris Lee days or he'd obviously be, yeah, would he be a nice bit younger than you now given that you're a dinosaur? But uh, <laughs> <laughs> when... You don't have to attack me to praise another lad. Like. <laughs> if I can attack you while praising someone, that's all, all the better. Uh, what, he would have, he'd be four or five years younger than you, would he? When did he... When did he break onto the scene? Those were the days, I suppose, when lads could play 
uh, adult hurling probably when they were four, 13 or 14, even yeah. if, they, if they wanted or they were good enough. Yeah, I think he's uh, six or seven years younger than me, but uh, he started playing senior for Burris Lee, age 15. And because it was so signposted that this lad is going to be very good, uh, it stood out to me when I marked him in his first ever training session at uh, for Burris Lee at senior level. And, it, you know, it was just immediately evident that he's really good. You know, it's just the touch, the movement, the calmness on the ball, you know, any which way you want to play it, he can do it. It was so obvious. And, you know, he's a big part of the Tipperary minor teams and no doubt even before that was under 14 and 16 and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, he was he was parachuted straight into the Burris Lee team from the get-go. At, at age 15, he scored three points in the North final against, uh, was it Tumi Vara? I think, I'm pretty sure it was Tumi Vara. Um, he was kind of picked at number 15, did a bit of a roaming role, you know, and people might say, oh, what's a North Tipperary? You know, people from outside Tipperary, they might think Asher North Tipperary, not that big of a deal. But, you know, when you're from North Tipperary, and maybe it's not contested quite as hotly now, but back then, winning a North title was massive, you know, and Tipperary weren't going to be going on to probably win a senior county title, or Bursley weren't going to win a senior county title at the time. Maybe, there, you know, there was a... You know, there was a chance to do that, but, you know, Tumi Vara were so unbelievably dominant. So to win a North title was a huge thing, massive thing in Burris Lee. So at 15 years of age, you have a lad coming in and he's been a difference maker and, you know, picked in the team and sort of, you know, it was slightly awkward at the time. I know you're going to ask me, so I might as well answer it before you, before you team me up. But, you know, he was picked ahead of his older brother, who was maybe not far off double his age uh, in the team. And it was a shock. And I was remember I remember being there when the team was announced. Uh, so it was a massive shock, but it, it just didn't bother him. And uh, he just went down and did the job. And that, doesn't that kind of sum it up, really? He just kind of went out there and did his job no matter where he was playing. Yeah, pretty much. And like I have to say, and I'll hold my hands up and be honest, that I definitely doubted whether he'd be able to come back uh, as good as he was from the cruise, just given his age profile when it happened. And I remember, I think Boris were playing... I think it was Clonaldi Ross Moore on TG Cahar yeah. uh, around April of 2019. And I remember seeing him and he was absolutely, he was in the like crazy, the crazily good condition. And they're just looking like this, if anything, this lad has come back from the cruise ship much better than he was. And then all of a sudden that carried into, yeah, funnily enough, that carried, that club came, campaign early in the year carried into tip and then carried into the club campaign at the end of the year in like, well, 2010, he was brilliant. And I just remember him when he was bursting on the scene in 2010. He was just, he was nearly unmarkable. I could just pick up a ball out in the middle of the field and just float it over. Kind of nearly like Tommy Walsh when he was in his younger days. He could just play anywhere around there, pick up a ball, run with it and put it over, particularly off the left. He's always, the signature would have always been the left. But as good as he was in 2010 in those early years, I thought 2019 was just the year of years. I'd say, I'd say, his, in his wildest dreams, he couldn't have envisaged a year like that. Yeah, man mark and roll after man mark and roll. I'm pretty sure he marks Tony Kelly. Um, I can't remember which of the guys it was for Wexford, but uh, marks TJ Reid in the final. I think and, he picked uh, up Rory O'Connor for Wexford, if I'm yeah, fairly sure, yeah. And uh, as it's mentioned already, Aaron Galan in the Munster final. So it was kind of the firefighter role. Wherever there is a problem for Tipperary, put him in there. And to be fair, comments are starting to flood in. Like people understand that he obviously was just a massive part of that Tipperary generation. It's, you know, there is going to be sort of a change in the guard overall in hurling at the moment. Maybe that won't be the last retirement we see for Tipperary. And we're, we're going to talk about some of the players who are over 30 that are currently operating at the top level in Deline McCarthy. But uh, there, there's going to be an element of change in the guard in the next year or two because, you know, Patrick Horgan's unbelievable and he's still flying at, at 33. But he can't go on forever. Joe Canning has obviously just stepped away and we'll see who else. But I'll just read out a couple of the comments here and maybe you can react off the back of it. Evan G, you'd expect Maher to be the first of a few that were retired from the tip camp this year. Lahan 874, big contribution to saying hi, but you're no harm. Keep any comments coming in. Shane Power, best wishes to Brendan in his retirement. He was not only a super captain in 2016, but he's one of been, been one of the most consistent players in the game for years. And that's from a Daisha fan. ML89 also uh, actually thought Brendan Maher was the best suited of the old guard to continue on for a few years. Super, super player. Didn't matter where he played, he was excellent. I'd well, agree with I'd agree with that, Shane. I would have agreed with that to be honest with you. Um, because uh, like I didn't think he was out of definitely wasn't out of place this year. Um, he would have been one of the more experienced lads that I would have expected probably potentially to still start next year, but there's a 
there's a thing kind of I'd say amongst the older players, even with Joe Cannon kind of stepping away and maybe now Brendan Matter and a couple more, the game is so pace focused now. Um, and it's obviously difficult to get much faster when you get to that age. But the lads coming through it, it is probably a bit frightening. And I, I've no, uh, I've no issue with a lad stepping aside after a career like that when you, you know, when you just think maybe it's becoming a bit too much. And obviously, the commitment for for thirteen years as well is massive. You're essentially putting your life on hold. Although it is something you absolutely love, you are putting your life on hold. So them boys deserve to go and enjoy their club careers and enjoy themselves outside of intercounty hurling. Yeah, Will says super player and terribly nice fella as well that he is. All earning haircut for the Saints is Mark Corcoran. Yeah, I did get a chop. I left it a little bit longer on top, I, and I'd imagine you've noticed. Uh, a bit like Verney there, only he refuses to chop down the sides a small bit. <laughs> you wouldn't hear one bad word against him either, says Pow Pow. Sounds like a sound chap. A class is on the pitch. We would have taken him in Watford. Uh, Will, how many times did he skin you in that training session, Staple? Oh, he got away once or twice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark Corcoran, he scored an equalising point for Boris against Toome at 15 in the last minute North Championship. It was. Uh, Owen, Brendan Maher's performance versus Ballygunner in 2019 was like Christy Ring versus Wexford in 1956. Jason, uh, Owen, uh, Owen has been watching Harlem for a while, I'd say. He has. Uh, Andrew Sullivan met him in Edinburgh in December 2011. Very nice lad. Stood and had a chat about Harlem with my friend and I in the middle of a nightclub. Top man. Niall Heffernan. Yeah, no hyperbole. He was unbelievable in the Munster Club final especially. Brilliant player to watch. Uh, <laughs> Will, I ran into him drunk on a stag once. I was drunk. He wasn't. Terrible nice fella. <laughs> Mr. Uh, GA123. End of an era in tip. Uh, Jack Nulty. Best wishes to Brendan. Great at the game. He was a legend in all meaning of the world. I'll just read through a couple more and we'll, we'll move on a little bit. Patrick Hickey, credit where credit is due. Brendan, some player for the last 10 years. Uh, arguably the best hurler in the country at one point in 2019, says Michael O'Callaghan. Brian McMahon, and finally, Brendan Maher was a savage hurler, could play it every way, size and skill. Uh, keep the comments coming in. We'll be touching on different different topics throughout the show. We're happy to, to move in all sorts of direction. End of an era in Tipperary? Uh, yeah, potentially, I suppose. Yeah, you're, you're looking at, you know, the age profile of him and Callan, uh, Bonner Mar, Park Mar, Noel McGrath, and a few more. You don't know who's going to be manager as well, which we'll go into in a bit. But just when people are coming there, just thinking, like, among the tip greats, where does where does Brendan Maher rank? And I suppose among the modern day greats, I wonder where does he does he rank as well? Because I think he ranks pretty highly uh, amongst the modern day greats. But we just start on the tip greats. Like where does he where does he rank among you know uh, you know John Doyle Jimmy Doyle Owen Kelly these sort of guys where where is he coming into that conversation? Well, it's, it's very difficult to talk about the players that you and I have never seen, so that's very difficult. But I think it has to be up there among you know I mean in terms of delivering as an All Ireland winning captain, in terms of playing there for thirteen years, you know being part of some of Tipperary's biggest days, obviously coming up short a couple of times in the All Ireland finals. Um, and I mean that as a team collectively, not Brendan. To be honest, I, I actually can't think of too many games where he didn't perform and perform well. It's pretty much nearly every single time that he, he delivered, as far as I'm concerned. And again, people might say, yeah, you're from Burris Lee, you'd say that. But I, I do think that's pretty pretty true. But I think it's up there with the, alongside the likes of Nicky English, alongside Owen Kelly, Lara Corbett, Seamus Callanan is going to be in there, Noel McGrath. I think it is up, you know, it's a conversation of the few, and I think he's going to be among those. Definitely, I know I'd agree, and even of the the modern day kind of tip players, even like you probably you know there's there's probably four guys there you probably nearly bunch together, and you would find it hard to separate them. Uh, Brendan Maher, Park Maher, Noel McGrath, and Seamus Callan. You do very very well to separate the four of them, and the fact that that Brendan was able to perform so well, like he as you said that when he did man mark and rolls, like he, he's he's kept T J Reid Reid quiet in all Ireland final. He's kept big players quiet in big games um, and he could just he had that temperament as well for the big occasion and as we saw with Boris you know if an opportunity arose he could have those like game defining season defining moments as well yeah I, I see like Liam Sheedy has been leading the tributes on Twitter there today and of course he would and Shane Power says lads do you think this is the start of the retirements for Tip and possibly hence the end of Liam Sheedy's tenure considering a lot of the lads have been with him since 2008 or sorry, 2009 and 10. And to be honest, even going further back with the minors as well. And I do kind of think that may, maybe, I mean, like you and I have already talked about in the last week or so, maybe a week or two at this point, that maybe it just feels, it feels like there's going to be a natural parting of the ways at this stage between the management and the Tipperary senior team. And when some of the players that were so synonymous with the management, 
it like whether it's right or wrong, whether it will happen or won't, it kind of does feel like that's what's about to happen. Yeah, I I think, and I know we probably had planned to talk about it later, but I think it's now is probably the perfect time to talk about like the the managerial merry-go-round that is going to go on over the next couple of weeks and months because I I wonder I wonder when you know Brendan retired, he's obviously had a conversation with Liam Sheedy. Is part of that conversation whether Liam is going to be there next year or not? I in my head I would think potentially that it that it is. And I just have a, I have a feeling there's going to be there's going to be change in Tip. Um, Liam's obviously you know Tip's Messiah. Two All Ireland wins. Uh, came back and won All Ireland in his first year in his second term. But I I would I I'd be I'd be more surprised if he stayed than if he left. And obviously that has massive uh, ramifications for things that are going on in other counties. Like this, this can happen. This can move so quickly. It's almost like Hurland's version of musical chairs. If Sheedy steps aside in Tipperary, like that call, you'd imagine like, unless like they're mad, that call to Liam Cahill has to come. So all of a sudden that has mass, could have massive ramifications in Waterford. If there's not an opening in Tip, I fully expect Liam Cahill to stay for at least two more years in Waterford. But are you telling me that if that call comes from Tipperary to manage his county team, essentially what he got into coaching for, coaching and management for, that he will turn it down. I cannot see him turn it down, regardless of what he's done with Waterford. You never know when the opportunity or the time will come again. So I just think it says, there's major things going to happen over the next couple of, Like, we're talking about an Ireland final on Sunday week. The things that are going on totally outside of that are as intriguing nearly to me. Yeah, intriguing is the word. It, it totally is. And, like, you've gone through the ramifications of what could and couldn't happen. And, I, like... When you go through that, my thought is, I think Liam Cahill is going to be the Tipperary manager in 2022. And so I do say, I, yeah. So do and I, yeah. And I, yeah. I say, I'd say there are people in Waterford that are wincing. And that's not to discount some of the other candidates. There are other candidates for the Tipperary job. And obviously, Liam Sheedy is still there. So, you know, you're being respect of, respectful of that. But, you know, this is like the, the high level of the sporting world. You know, it's at the elite level of GEA. These things are going to be talked about. It's just kind of a fact of it. And like everything seems to suggest this is the logical step. Like it's undeniable in terms of logic because you're thinking, okay, some of the older older players are possibly going to walk away now. I'm not sure if too many of the older players would want to stay on and be, you know, bit part players. Maybe one would start. I don't know. But, you know, you're in that modern world now where it's a different type of hurling that's being played and younger players are going to be brought through and the logic shows that Liam Cahill has brought all those players through and been crucial to their development along with their clubs and also personally those players developed. And is he the guy that's most likely to bring them through to the modern type of hurling that turned Waterford from a team that hadn't won a game in two seasons to a team that's challenging the very best? In terms of logic, it makes total sense. And he was the one make, uh, you know, developing these underage hurlers for Tipperary and talking about how I'm not going to send soft hurlers up the line. You know, it's a line we've kind of mentioned a few times here on the show. But all of that just screams, yeah, Liam, Liam Cahill's going to be over the team in 2022. Yeah, I've been talking to a couple of Waterford people uh, and I've kind of uh, pleaded my case or my opinion. Like, I, I do think all the stars will align over the coming weeks. I just think that's, I do think that's the way it's going to happen. Um, And, you know, a couple of people, a couple of Waterford folk have said to me, like, are you telling me like that he's going to leave Waterford, who are you know serious All Ireland contenders at the moment, to go back to Tipperary to rebuild? Was the word that they use? I thought Liam Cattle was mad going to Waterford in the first place, if I'm honest, because they were at a seriously low ebb. Me and you talked about it on the show, 100%. I can remember it. Uh, uh, Ty Deborka did his cruciate, I think, not long after Liam Cattle was announced as manager. So he was essentially going to miss the vast majority of the. The first year, obviously, COVID worked, kind of worked in their favour and he was back. But I thought he was a small bit mad. Uh, I thought there was, you know, maybe a bit of madness in even dropping Noel Connors and Morris Shanahan. Kind of look how that turned out with the way his team was set up. He obviously wanted players, a uh, different type of player. Uh, I just think timing is everything here. Like, just say Liam Cattle stays with Watford and someone else takes over tip and, you know, they do very well over the next couple of years and they get an extension for another two years and then all of a sudden Liam Cattle's opportunity to manage tip may, may not come. It is all about timing. And I'm just saying, if, are you telling me that if the call comes to Liam Cattle, are you interested in managing tip senior hurlers? Uh, regard, uh, his ties to Watford are huge, I'm sure. 
But don't tell me that he could say no to Tipperary. That is why he's doing what he's doing. That's why him and Mikey Beavens went down to Waterford. They essentially went to Waterford without disrespect to Waterford. That's a building block for him to be the Tipperary manager. And that's just a fact. Mm, okay, well, we definitely want people's comments in on that, especially from the Waterford side of things. And we're going to come to Brian Cody and his future in a while. And it's a similar thing there. What happens for Brian Cody? There's a lot of guys that have come out of Kilkenny in the last couple of years, former players and so on that maybe would be great managers in, in their own right. Are they going to continue to wait their turn? Or are they going to manage elsewhere? And obviously there's there's a, va a vacancy in, in Wexford, for example. So there's a lot to talk about with that. Well, like, can I just jump back to a couple of more of the comments and we might move on yeah. a little bit. So James Max is incredible to see him as in Brendan join the Burris legends of Bobby Ryan, Jimmy Finn and Sean Kenny as All-Ireland uh, winning captain in 2016, especially after the disappointment of 2014, one of the greats. Uh, Owen, let's not forget he came from a crucial to win an All-Star and an All-Ireland. Alan T, Liam Cahill's post-match comments must have hit home. A couple more retirements on the cards, you'd imagine. It's so, like, it's a bit of a, you know, <laughs> it's a bit of an unusual one to be talking about Liam Cahill's comments affecting Tipperary players when he's still the Waterford manager, but there you go. Uh, Pow Pow, again, a good point here. Reminds me of Michael Fenley in terms of importance for Tip. Totally underrated player. Goes unnoticed at times. He's up there with the greats. Wonder does Vernie have any insight into the Clare County board dragging their heels on renewing uh, Brian Lohan as manager? And this is another one we wanted to come to because Tony Kelly said this week, if Brian Lohan wants to stay on, Brian Lohan should get the job. I don't have too much insight on it, but like, how is there even a debate? How is there even a debate about whether Brian Lone should be manager next year? Like, from the basket case, by all accounts, that people within Clare will tell you that the Clare County Board is at the moment. All of a sudden, he's able to have, you know, I would say two seasons that were both a resounding success, where to me, anyway, they uh, exceeded my expectations of them, and probably a lot of people within Clare they probably exceeded their expectations. Uh, I just con I contacted uh, Peter Duggan the other day to see uh, there was rumours of him coming home. He's back home. He's going to be hurling with Clooney Quinn in the Clare Senior Hurling Championship. All of a sudden, he might be back on board for Clare next year. Shane O'Donnell, uh, who was out obviously with concussion most of this year, fair chance of him coming back. Um, like then all of a, all of a sudden you're thinking they're two of our best forwards. O'Donnell's not an all star, but he you know in in other worlds he'd be a multiple all star. Duggan is an all star forward, free taker as well. Uh, having those two back on board, how much optimism would you go into next year? Uh, with it's just it, it's scarcely believable that Brian Lawn has not been you know rubber stamped as manager. Uh, maybe that's symptomatic of what is actually going on in Clare at the moment. You'd imagine, like, within a week of Clare being knocked out of the championship by Cork. You know, like, if you look at it as well, Shane, like, Tony Kelly's shot goes in past Patrick Collins. Where, yeah. would, Clare, where, where would Clare be now? Like, their, their form has been subsequently, you know, massively franked by, by Cork. W would it be inconceivable to say that Clare would be in the All-Ireland final? Probably wouldn't be, been, on, been honest with you. So, um, I'd imagine Brian Lone, I I could imagine, unless... unless his dealings with the, you know people behind the scenes in Clare are incredibly tough, and it, they're and his, like his job has been undermined. I'd I'd imagine he's going to be there for at least another two years. Yeah, I believe he's waiting for some sort of an internal report or review, and maybe that's holding things up. But the only way he doesn't stay on is if there's somehow some internal wrangling, and Clare decide that we want to pick a gun up, turn it down at our feet, and just shoot away because it would just. It would just be crazy. By the way, I just have a, a Photoshop job coming in here. Uh, again, it's related to Brendan Maher, but more so about how I'd be going on to, uh, going on about him. <laughs> 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 that's that's happened. I'd be quietly confident that, that has happened, particularly uh, that night or in the days after the All Ireland semi final win over Thomas's. Shane, can I just say something as well? Um, <laughs> Davy Fitz is obviously uh, free at the moment as well. So that adds further spice to the Clare situation potentially and within other counties. Like there's, I've never been more intrigued by a man managerial merry-go-round than this year. Like oh, I'm, I'm literally buzzing over <laughs> what could potentially happen in all the moving parts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, a couple of more comments in here, Shane Power. Following on from Vernie's point, as a Dacia man, I'm very concerned that this may be the start of Liam Cahill becoming tip manager in the next few months, and then who would be next for us in Watford? And you just mentioned a certain man, Dave. You wonder, would he go back again? What if Sheedy went to Watford and Cahill to tip? Great storyline that would be. <laughs> this isn't Popo. like this isn't like wrestling where there's like a double turn and they both end up going to different factions or counties. I, I, can't, I can't see that happening somehow. As, as good as it would be, if it was make-believe, maybe. 
Uh, PH12, Liam Cahill was at the Cork Watford minor game the other night. Not sure if that means anything. That is an interesting point if he was there. Yeah, Cook Vision, why do you spend so much time on Typical Kilkenny? Do political podcast focus as much on the Roman Empire, I wonder? <laughs> but look, that's just the way the conversation has gone and the comments are coming in. So we're going to roll with it. It looks like Watford beating Galway and Tipperary has many looking at the future at their future in Galway and Tipperary. Uh, Lahan agree with Vernie there. Can't remember which point, but uh, it's good to have someone on your side for once. <laughs> also, Galway were looking for a manager most likely. We'll see what happens with Shane O'Neill. Just, just on that, Shane, there was uh, there was comments from the the Galway hurling board uh, subcommittee chairman. I think Paul Bellew is his name, saying that there, there wasn't a vacancy in Galway and that there was basically uh, an in. And a kind of an internal review between players and management and I believe the county board as well but he seemed fairly adamant that there wasn't a vacancy at that time but again that, you don't know how that's going to play out you don't know how that review is going to go over the next couple of weeks so that's going to be really like you're basically looking at you know potential vacancy in tip potential vacancy in Waterford potentially the biggest vacancy in the history of Hurling if Brian Cody leaves Kilkenny uh, Galway potentially I know they're saying it's not vacant but that could be vacant too you have vacancies in Westmead you have vacancies in Kerry and you have Davy Fitz free like so it's yeah I don't know this is like this is a, better than East Enders for me to be honest with you <laughs> uh, Jack Nolte saying to Cool Vision Brendan Maher retired and went out champion and Kilkenny have a few older players too how can you not focus on that they give good analysis to most teams we do try to do that but obviously uh, now and again a little bit of certain biases will lead us to, to talk a bit more about other teams but also maybe what the people are looking to talk about as is reflected in the comments do you think all five Munster counties would have beaten Kilkenny this Ooh. year if they met um, I look do I think that that Cork, well, Cork obviously did after extra time. And I think part of that was Cork should have won that game in normal time, but Kilkenny showed great stuff to come back and uh, take it to extra time. But they were gone well ahead. And then there was, I think there was a bit of white line fever towards the end. Do I think Limerick would have beaten Kilkenny this year? I think they would have beaten them heavily enough this year. Uh, recent history suggests Tipperary, even though Tipperary weren't flying, but Tip and Kilkenny play a similar type of game. Kilkenny were obviously trying to evolve a bit more. I think Tip would have beaten them. Uh, then it's down to Watford. Watford beat them last year. Watford, in some ways, feel like they've kicked on their system this year. So I think Watford would. And then Clare and Kilkenny. That's an interesting one. What do you think? Yeah, uh, out of all those, yeah. I think Clare and Kilkenny would be a really close one. But God, I'd love to. I'd love. Like, we just don't see Clare against Kilkenny in the championship enough. I'd love to see that matchup. Yeah, that's. Uh, that, I think that would probably be the most likely game that it would come down to whether whether they'd win or whether Munster Counties would win all five or whether it could be four. Clare did beat them at the end of the league. Whether that means anything, I'm not. I'm not sure. But that would be yeah, be hard call a winner in that now. Definitely be hard call a winner in that. But like as much of an advocate of Leinster hurling as I am, it's you know it's very hard to go away from the fact that. You know, Limerick are the dominant force. Would Limerick beat Kilkenny? They would. Cork just beat them. Waterford beat them last year. Um, Tip historically uh, in the last, you know, in the 19 final, the 16 final, last couple of years, have had the strong hand on them. So I'd say it would come down to Clare. And I would, you couldn't really confidently call that game either. Yeah, John Heenan and Eddie Brennan to Wexford. Naughty enough saying that to me when he's currently coach at Kula. Adrian McGrath, the executive have been told that Lowen wants three years. He is not waiting for anything. Any delay is down to the executive, not simply ratifying him, not speculation, facts. And I believe uh, Adrian is well plugged into the Clare politics there. So, but, but just on that, Shane, like, it, like if, he wants, if he wants that, like uh, that's not like, I know there's red tape and things to go through, but you just go and, you just go and get it done. And to be honest with you, you nix any talk that us or anybody else is having about, you know, Claire not being sorted for next year. And plus, you allow Brian Lowen to be in a situation where he can go and talk to Peter Duggan and he can go and look at younger players and be planning for next year. Yeah, interesting point here from Shane Power. Will Matty Kenny go to Galway? And look, I know you've kind of said what the hurling board in Galway said, but the Dublin job may have been a trial for him like the Waterford job may be for Liam Cal. Interesting point. I, I know he, like, I mean, from knowing him in the dressing room and, and talking to him, not recently now, I might add, since the end of the season, but like he is a guy who looks at it too like a project and he wants to take it all the way, as he probably did with us, I suppose. But... I don't feel like the Dublin project is finished. You know, they, I think they're actually getting there. And obviously the COVID thing ruined the Leinster final and just, you know, kind of, you know, took away from the whole thing. But um, I, I don't know. But again, the lure of home, how do you say no? Yeah, the the double. I did a piece on the, the merry-go-round the other day and Dublin wasn't something that I'd really factored into the equation because 
I do after this year in particular, I expect him to stay on. But as I said about timing, right? When Michal Donahu like left kind of and shocked everybody, I think it was, you know, at the end of the summer in uh, in 2019, Dun uh, Kenny was involved with Dublin. So his chance was gone, you know, to be Galway manager. I'm sure that's something he wants to do. So it is all about timing. If the Galway vacancy came up and again, if he's rang, you know, are you interested or we want you, like, how do you turn that down as well? It's it's very difficult. I don't think like it's it's only the pull it's the pull from home that almost gives guys leverage. I think that gives Liam Cahill leverage. Like, I nobody can deny him if he wants to be Tipperary manager. Like yeah. he can't as much as with the best will in the world, and even if he's committed to Waterford for another two years, if Tip come knocking, I just think that's a little that's a caveat that there's nothing we can do about that, and we just have to let him go. And I think the same would be the case with with Kenny uh, if Galway came knocking. Yeah, so people, do you think that those would be good moves for both the managers and the counties? Brian McNamara asks about Matty, but also um, separately, has Peter Casey any chance for reprieve? Now, he it looks like he's uh, he's going to appeal that red card. We've seen stranger things happen. We really do. So, um, I mean, I don't think, I don't like seeing red cards given out too handily. I Looking at the footage, to me, I can't see enough to suggest, like, I mean, I can by the letter of the law, I can see, yeah, I can see why the referee did it. That's fine. No issue with the referee, John Keenan, did his job. But, I mean, to me, a lad missing an All-Ireland final over that and also what we've seen other lads get away with. I mean, like, think of it this way. I mean, obviously, I'm an Austin Gleeson fan, but he popped the helmet straight off Luke Mead's helmet before the 2017 All-Ireland final in the semi-final against Cork didn't get suspended. I mean, Adrian Tui pulled the helmet off somebody, I'm not sure which Tipperary player, in the semi-final that same year. Wasn't banned for the final. I think stranger things have happened than like getting off for the final than, you know, Peter Casey in this situation. Bit more difficult when he was actually shown a red. You know, the precedent of, you know, the, the referee didn't deal with it on the day for the Gleason situation or the Adrian Tui situation. So it's very hard to go and retrospectively uh, deal with it. Casey was sent off on the day. I'd love to know the you know the reasoning behind it or who actually saw it. Uh, I think he I think John Keenan went to his linesman on that side. I think he went to his two umpires at the Davin end side. So he obviously got, you know, uh, some information from them. Uh, I had a high profile, you know, referee on to me Sunday night, Monday morning, just saying like that they might as well rip up the rule book if Casey gets off under appeal. Um so Terry Kelly John said that to you. No, a high profile referee, I said. <laughs> <laughs> a high profile referee Pierre Luigi uh, Kalina <laughs> so like that yeah. anyone that knows the WWE uh, Earl Hebner was on to me Sunday night <laughs> Monday morning uh, but it was down with, we were down with John Kiley on, on Tuesday afternoon they had gotten the referees report on Monday night uh, I, I think I've only seen the referees report once I'd love to you know I'd love to see the word around what John Keenan said but I think they had 48 hours to decide whether they wanted to lodge an appeal and they had a meeting at the end of train on Tuesday night and obviously decided to lodge an appeal. Uh, that would suggest that they feel they have a decent chance of getting off or potentially have some footage that maybe where it doesn't look uh, as incriminating. They don't want to be dragged through the boardroom over the next while. So like they want, they'd want that heard this week. They don't want to drag it into next week and, you know, the will he, won't he start. But I think this has massive ramifications on, you know, who's going to be all Ireland champions for 2021. Just say Peter Casey doesn't start, right? So you're probably going to start uh, Graham Mulcahy, who hasn't lit it up this year and was obviously taken off in the all Ireland final last year and is not coming in in probably great form. Even he was, he threw up a ball the other night and was blocked down, which is not something that we'd see. So he's, he's brought in from the start. Then all of a sudden you've taken away one, you know, impact forward. Just say hypothetically, Graham McCarthy doesn't go well, and he's you know, he's pulled off after forty or forty-five minutes. Mm -hmm. Then you're bringing in Pat Ryan or, or you know, Connor Boyle in earlier than normal. Then all of a sudden you're looking at Dermot Burns, who was in a boot coming into the game, or who was in a boot. Uh, in, he could still be in a boot and will miss miss a couple of a bits of training because of an, an ankle going over in his ankle. Maybe he picks up a knock or gets a reoccurrence and he is to come off as well. Barry Nash carried a knock out of the game the other day. So all of a sudden, Limerick's panel looks really, really extended. And they're up, you know, the options that we've all talked about for a long, long time, those same options may not be there. And it's okay coming in for five or ten minutes if that's your role. How about coming in for 40 or 45 minutes? All of a sudden, that's a different demographic to it all altogether.
Yeah, no, you make a great point on that. I'm looking at the, the options for inside forwards based on the match programme the last day. And Graham Mulcahy, yeah, he'd be number one for that. He has been the one coming in. He obviously started the Munster final. Barry Murphy, I don't think we've seen him play championship action in, in a few years now. Cahill O'Neill, very young guy. You know, I don't, not that he doesn't have the quality, but maybe it's too early. I mean, John Kiley has used him pretty sparingly. Pat Ryan is generally brought in for last five or ten minutes a game. So, like you said, would that be a big... Um, would they see it as a risk? I mean, they, there must be some sort of reason they don't bring him in early because whatever it is about his explosive pace in the last five minutes when teams are tiring, it always seems to have an impact. He always seems to get a point or he always seems to get a goal or something like that. So they've they've kind of nailed their colours to the mast to some degree in terms of what they expect from him. And then if you look at the Cork side of things, the lads they can bring off the bench in the forward line, Shane Kingston, Alan Cadigan, Alan Connolly, Declan Dalton. I actually would say that uh, Cork have better options than Limerick. Now, we'll preview the game more next week, but uh, in some ways, I'd, I'd make the case that Cork have a better panel than Limerick. Yeah, I wouldn't uh, wouldn't disagree with you, to be honest with you. And even if you look at like how late, John, they were obviously uh, they were down to 14 men, but if you look at how late they, they ran the bench the other day, you know, David Reedy comes on after 66, Graham Mulcahy and Richie English, you know, both come on 68, Conor Boyle in 70, Colin Coughlin in 73. And two of those were only came in because there were injuries. Um, you know, they're definitely running their bench a lot later, and they're definitely this year and had the stats on it, like the impact off the bench is an awful lot less than it has been in recent years. And of all the teams, um, maybe it's why one of the reasons they're champions, it has generally been the same personnel playing in the vast majority of games since 2018. So yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be really interesting if they have to rejig and you know, move things around. John Kiley said the other day, uh, David Dempsey and Adrian Breen, who uh, neither of which I think were on the 26th the other day, he said that they they will be in contention to come back in. So potentially they might be guys that were going to come in off the bench, but we've seen very little of them this year as well. Yeah, I mean, that is the thing. They both are very good players, but, you know, there's a reason, there's a pecking order there for a reason. They haven't been used, so that kind of suggests where the management see them in in the in their overall plans. And if they're not in there, it's it's because of how the management view them. But that doesn't mean that lads can't come in out of the cold and do a job. It's kind of been done before. Perfect example: Wally Walsh in 2012. I mean, he was a young player and hadn't been used previously, and all of a sudden he comes in out of nowhere and gets the job done. So you you just don't know in these situations. By the way, just a reminder, we're brought to you by Torpy and the Bamboo Hurley. Get 10% off using the promo code or game. The the link of where you can buy that is in the description, so click on that. And then also a reminder of the uh, Patreon that uh, if you want to support the channel, go to patreon.com forward slash our game. Five are a month to support it and uh, keep driving the channel on into the future. And uh, of course, then there's also Please do uh, subscribe. If you if you watch the show on YouTube, please do subscribe. It makes a difference. It helps build the channel. So like, comment, all that kind of stuff makes a big difference. And we really would appreciate that. Uh, are we going to move on to the next topic? Or no, no we're, no, we're not. Because we have left out the most important part of the managerial merry-go-round. And that's the future of Brian Cody. And My many pe- many people will say... Like and I'm one of them. That Brian Cody has as much time there as he as he wants. So obviously, I think I think next year will be his twenty third season. Did a piece on it the other day. Um, we were in the middle of the Bill Clinton Monica Lewinsky scandal when when Cody took over. Like that's just how long ago it is. Like it's crazy, really. When, a lot when, of when, the young people who watch this show don't even know who you're <laughs> talking about. Well, they need to they need to uh they need to brush up on their history and their kind of general knowledge in that case. Uh I just uh, on Cody There's a good story uh, about a cigar there, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> I won't say any more than that. Just on Cody, uh Sean Flynn, who the former tip stats man, uh did you know some really good work on Kilkenny the other day. And uh, he just had a tweet up there at Hurling Talk One. It was on August 9th. He just said, Yesterday as all Ireland semi final show glimpses of the team Kilkenny could become when they use the ball well from their back line. However, when they delivered the ball long from inside their 45 metre line and lost possession, it allowed Cork to counter attack. So there's, there's, the stats were actually really interesting. So when they hit the ball from, you know, deliver the ball into their own attack from inside their own 45, they hit 19, won six, lost 13. That's 31%. Uh, conversion rate when it was between the 45 and the 65 they hit 15 won 6 and lost 9 that was only 40% and then uh, you know between the two midfield lines they hit 13 balls in won 11 and lost 2 that was 84% so Cody has you know changed how they play but 
there was they do still go back to you know that bit of kind of ignorance maybe not you know that living in a good long ball and i listen i'm totally an advocate and i know you are for leaving in a long ball every now and then but you know the stats will back up the fact that when kilkenny play the ball through the lines and work it through the hands that they're a lot, an awful lot more efficient and that would be one of the things that people would throw at cody maybe that he hasn't moved with the times i'm not so i'm not so sure like about that whether he hasn't moved at the times and personally i think that like anybody that's saying you know cody out or that you know, Cody definitely has to go or whatever. I don't. I don't necessarily agree with that. They've won two Leinster titles in the last two years. They're they don't have the same squad that they've had in previous years. And I said before, if you take Owen Murphy, Parik Walsh, and TJ Reid out of that team, you know they're you know it's, they're a skeleton of what they look like at the moment. I think the big thing is you know who would the replacement be if people are looking for change. You know, are they going to get a lot better out of changes? There are a lot of players that aren't involved because Brian Cody is manager. I don't, I don't think so. Obviously, Colin Fenley opt, opted out for this year. Uh, reasons really unknown, but it was basically a break that he was taking. So I think you Kenny people need to be careful, um, you know, that they might you know, they might get what they want maybe with Cody leaving, but, you know, the results of that or the consequences of it mightn't be what they think. Yeah, I, I, I do want to know what Kenny people think of this. You know, would, it, would another manager have gotten more than two Leinster titles in the past couple of years? I know the league doesn't mean a whole lot this year, but obviously uh, finished top of their group and that at the same time. Are there players that, that should be there that aren't there? Are there players there that aren't playing to their potential? This is the question. Uh, you know, Paul Young here has come in with a comment. Great hurler, Brendan Maher. I can see Henry Shefflin and Eddie Brennan as his right-hand man for the Kilkenny job if Brian does go. Like, who's not playing up to their potential? I mean, do you think that... They want to move away from long ball. So he's obviously made some attempt to do that. Whether that's the players asking the manager or the manager telling the players, you know, that remains to be seen. I can't imagine too many people would be telling Brian Cody what to play hurt. <laughs> I think that, not. No, definitely not. But it is year one for them. Now, we've already talked about how Liam Cahill, who hasn't won all the All-Irelands that um, Brian Cody has won. So, you know, we, we're obviously respectful of that. But surely there, there's... You could make a point that Brian Cody needs more than one year to kind of turn that around. And on the basis of what he's done previously, you know, you give him an opportunity to do that. Or, or do you say, look, Kilkenny have done the six in a row now without all Ireland's, give someone else a chance? Yeah, you could say that. But like, it's not as if like they're not performing up to a really, really high level. To me, they're perform like, could Kilkenny be playing much better than they are at the moment? I honestly don't think so. I genuinely don't. <clears throat> that, that's the thing. Now, the only thing I will say is, do I think Brian Cody should finish up? I think now is the perfect time for him to finish up in many ways. He's achieved, you know, his achievements are, you know, the length of many people's arms. Like he's, you know, so many achievements down through the years. Um, he, he like he's he has to be a small bit jaded at this stage. He has, and I, I just thought like this is only me personally, and I, I this is not, and this is just my own comment. I just, I actually thought. You know, over the weekend, I actually thought it was the first time I thought he actually looked older on the sideline. I didn't think he, you know what I mean? He's obviously 67 years old. I never thought he really looked his age, maybe until the weekend. I hope that's not, that's just my own personal opinion and just something I think. But I just think, um, I think this year would be, you know, a good way for him to go out having achieved so much. I, I would hate for it to end up in a case like with Mickey Hart in Tyrone where essentially he's been edged out of the job uh, because he's achieved so much. I think it could happen. I think it could happen. It's getting to that stage. Like, and this is just talking anecdotally. I feel a certain frustration from, uh, from Kilkenny people. And when they, you know, when the talk is that they'd out muscle Cork going into this game, and uh, Michael will just be back there in a second. I think like you do hear the talk that uh, Kilkenny are going to out muscle Cork coming into the into the All-Ireland semi-final. It doesn't happen. And then it's pretty clear that Cork have moved in a new direction with how they're hurling. Obviously, most other counties, they see what Liam Cahill is doing in the neighbouring county. That And you know that it's been so long since Kilkenny beat a Munster team in the championship. There probably is a little bit of... Um, there's probably itchy feet to some degree based on, on where the team is going. And I'll just look at some of the comments here now. Uh, Popo, Kilkenny are hitting their potential, just not as good as they were. Andrew Sullivan, eating bread is quickly forgotten. Cody owes nothing to Kilkenny uh, people. He should go on his terms. Cody is getting the best out of a goodish Kilkenny team. And that is, that is a point. 
Um, Michael Tracy says, think it's disrespectful to describe Waterford job as a stepping stone. No, I don't mean it. Don't mean it like that. You know, I don't mean it like that. It's not. It's not a stepping stone. But essentially, Liam Cahill is in management to manage Tipperary to win an All Ireland. That's just a fact of it. And he's you know serving his apprenticeship. Is he like? I, it's, he doesn't view it as a step and so on. And the last two years would definitely not suggest that. That's not, it's not been disrespectful and just stating as a matter of fact, he wants mm. to manage Tipperary at some stage. That's just a fact of life. Like, Yeah, I take your point for what it is. Uh, Kilkenny post Cody could be like Arsenal. Oh, we're sick of finishing fourth. We need to be in contention. Wenger leaves abject since then. There is that point too. You know, if someone picks it up, it doesn't necessarily mean improvement. Shane Power says, Brian Cody's like the Undertaker. No matter how long he's there, how old he is, he's still the best of the best. The real world heavyweight champion. Eddie Brennan is the man. Lots more comments coming and keep them coming in here. And, Just on uh, that, Shane, as well, there are candidates now, whereas there mightn't have been a couple of years ago. Eddie Brennan has, you know, he's obviously been with Leash a couple of years. Henry's with Bally Hale two years. Um, uh, a joining of a couple of different forces could leave a very potent management team, be it next year or over the next couple of years. Yeah, there's plenty more comments coming in, and one of them is about uh, Peter Casey. Casey's a decent player, but not a key player for Limerick's as Declan O'Keefe. I disagree. I, I disagree think he's too. Hugely yeah. important. I think he's an excellent player, very elusive, wins frees, get back, bit of a like he's always a good outlet for the ball. I'd be um, I'd be very worried about Limerick's chances if uh, if if he wasn't available, and certainly if Dermot Burns ends up not being able to play to his full potential. Jeez, I think, um, look, I'm actually leaning towards Cork as it is. Look, we're going to t talk about that game next week, uh, but um, I am leaning towards him. Kevin O'Sullivan, Cody consistently gets the most out of his players. I wish we had someone like him in uh, Galway and then Cahill or Reardon. Cody has been, uh, has Kilkenny performing to their maximum. That, and that is the thing. Are they performing to their maximum? I don't always believe that, um, that the supporters think that's the case. I think most of the county would defer to him and say, look, Cody's a legend and that's that. But I do think there's a, there's a growing element of people who don't necessarily believe that's the case. And Isaac Dolan adds in DJ Carey also. There is one player that we do want to talk about, unless you want to put in a final point on Brian Cody there. A player that we wanted to talk about was Owen Cadigan, because it's probably slipped under the radar a little bit. But the Douglas man is in a position to win All-Ireland titles in both hurling, having done so previously in football. He was an All-Ireland winner as a starter in that team against Down in 2010. So he has that obviously flip-flop between the codes for a while. And in some ways, it always felt like this is kind of ca coming against him. But Jerry Millerick went off injured during the semi-final against Kilkenny. Who knows if he'll be right with a hamstring in the space of two weeks. Generally, that's not going to be the case or you won't see out the game. So... If, if if Cork win, Owen Cadigan would be the first man since uh, 1990 to win an All-Ireland in both codes. That'd be something else. Yeah, it'd be savage. And the fact that like his football All-Ireland came 11 years ago and he yeah. kind of moved between football and hurling. And every year in the winter, it was almost like, you know, who will Cadigan commit to this year? Or is he trying both? Or, you know, it's hurlers one year, footballers for another couple of years. He's obviously on board with the hurlers now. He's going to be 35 next month. Um and he, he came in, he's a real dog in fairness to him. He's a real, you know, he's a real tough uh, kind of throwback of a defender almost. And I, when he came on the other day, I was kind of, kind of there was a small bit of you know, like worry almost in the sense that I thought Kilkenny might be able to get at him or something like that. But, you know, he, I just thought he was very, very solid. He just does the simple things right in fairness to him. And uh, it'd be amazing. It'd be amazing achievement. And I was only thinking as well, like, you know, what the Cadigan household was like in the build-up to that match, you know, neither of them starting. Then all of a sudden, like, the game is over and they're both heroes. Like, it's amazing how quickly things can change. And I think it's a great, uh, it's, that sort of a, an attitude is a great thing for, you know, young players to look at, even if you're not starting or anybody on, on a squad. You can, like, you're only, like, one chance or one ball away from being a hero, really. Do you know yeah. what I mean? If, if you do something when the opportunity arises and those two boys definitely took their chances and Owen Cadigan is, you know, probably going to start an All-Ireland final now and is very, very close to doing something that you know very few people have done. And the majority of those that have done it are from his own county, be it Dennis Walsh or Teddy McCarthy or you know these sort of players. Yeah, and looking at some of the others that have tried it in recent times, Sean Oak tried the double in 1999, obviously didn't quite work out for him. Alan Kearns came on as a sub in the 71st minute for the Galway footballers in 2001, got his All-Ireland there and then lost the final in 2005 to Cork. I believe he scored a, a few points that day. It's mad to think it's that long ago since Cork won in All-Ireland. But I think this would be a serious achievement for Cadigan. And I watched back the Cork 
Limerick Munster semi final, which was only what what is it? it must be seven weeks, weeks ago. I think. Yeah, seven yeah. weeks ago at this stage. And uh, he was marking Tom Morrissey, did a very good job, and Tom Morrissey was taken off early in the second half. Now, you can say Limerick have moved on since then. You could also say Cork have moved on since then. And I have to say, I think it is a big blow to, to not have Jerry Millerick if he can't start. I think he's really, really good and probably underappreciated at this stage. But um, I do think Cadigan did well in that game, and it's not like he's going to be coming in cold. Because this game went to extra time, he played the guts of a full game. So, geez, it'd be some achievement age 34. Is there a fair chance, Shane, that if he does this on Sunday week, that he could be the last man to win uh, All Ireland's and both codes? Because I find it very hard with the commitment. Like, who's playing duel at at you know a top level now? There's nobody playing duel, um, and unless you know you spend a good lot of years, maybe some of the Dublin footballers come back hurling or something like that. I I I think it's not inconceivable to think that he could be the last man to win uh, All Ireland's and both codes at senior level. Yeah, Sean, Sean O'Donoghue, the cornerback, he would have been a very good uh, footballer under age. Um, so maybe at some stage down the line, could he go and play football? I don't know. There's a lot of these Cork players that have such speed. You'd imagine them be very good footballers at the same time. I think it's a good point, a very good point. Does anyone else, can anyone else think of anyone out there? Is there someone in the dual counties of the likes of uh, Galway? Maybe uh, maybe at a stretch, I could say Tipperary to all Ireland semi finals in the past uh, five seasons. I was a I, I stretch, a stretch, I was going to say awfully. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, you, you know, don't know. I mean, a few more Liam Kerms is coming. There's a few coming. There's a few coming. Uh, Cormac Egan would definitely be one at, at under 20 level anyway. But we're probably a bit away from that. We have an under 20 final to look forward to Sunday. We're a bit away from winning, you know, senior all Ireland's of football and hurling level again, I think. But you never know. And I can sense that you're feeling confident about beating Ross Common in the all Ireland under 20 football final. I am confident to an extent, but I'm also, there's also a little bit of worry because they're going in as favourites to this game. Which they you know they were rank outsiders against Cork, rank outsiders against Dublin, produced the goods. They were favourites in their you know Leinster quarter final and semi final against Westmead and Wexford, and kind of just got over the line. So there's a small bit of worry, but there's a couple of things. Roscommon have only had a week to get ready for the final. After we've had two weeks, they're brought well back down to earth now at this stage. And uh, the captain, I think, is back available again. And the style that they play, they're actually, people don't realise as much, they're, they're quite defensive when they don't have the ball. They drop a lot of bodies behind the ball, but when they break out, it's like freestyle football. It's it's really enjoyable to look, look at. And I think under 20 is particularly enjoyable because they're not afraid to make mistakes. Like They made tons of mistakes against Cork, but they just kept going back and back again. Whereas at senior level, if they made those mistakes... They'd near, you'd nearly be hounded out of the place by supporters and you could be pulled off by management. So, But they're, they're an absolute joy to look at. Uh, I think I'm working at that game Sunday, so looking forward to that. But we're playing in Crow Park for the third time this year across football, uh, senior football, senior hurling, under 20 football. And like before this year, I can't remember the last time we played a championship in Crow Park. So it's it's great just to be back there. It'd be nice to cap it off, cap off a great season with an All-Ireland as well. Yeah, when you have the right people involved, it's it's amazing the difference in such a short space of time. And awfully, I'll be in at that game as well. Will Colin Fenley return next year to Kilkenny as you and Cashman? That's an interesting one. Will Colin Fenley return if Brian Cody is there? In all honesty, I think that's the really interesting question. Um, and that just remains to be seen, I think. Um, and will, will Richie Hogan be there? Will TJ Reid be there? Will be there? Will they be there if Brian Cody is there? If someone else is there, will they be there? Or you know, would does the manager make a difference to them? You know, it's a it's a tough one. A few more comments coming in though. Do you, do you want to talk on that? Yeah, just just like Henry Shefflin is you know mooted as the next manager. Now he's obviously never commented. On. Some people say as well, you know, why aren't these Kilkenny lads saying that they want the job? It's the same as like Peter Canavan is never going to say he wants wanted his own job when Mickey Hart is there. Yeah. Nobody, you know, you can't. Nobody is going to say it. It's it's it is quite disrespectful, and I just think what they've you know what they had won with Mickey Hart and what the Kilkenny players have won under Brian Cody, they're not going to do that. So you're not going to have lads sticking their hands up saying I want to be Kilkenny manager. But you know if if Henry was manager and probably his his brother Tommy would probably be involved as coach, um you know the Ballyhale lads aren't going anywhere, and Colin Fenley is back on the scene. You'd imagine having you know they're not going to they're not going to let. Henry Dowen and a guy who's brought them two club All-Irelands in recent years as well. 
Yeah. Uh, Patrick Coleman says, Casey gives a lot of passes for scores, works very hard. Fact, yeah, so yeah. with us on him. Uh, Michael Callan, will Derek McGrath be back in Waterford or another county next year? You know, th there is the thing. Wexford is yeah. open. Will Waterford be? We don't know. And I mean, maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't want to be involved. Galway should have done it in 2001. Of course, Kearns also played it uh, in that final. I mentioned the fact that he was also there in 2005. Is this the first All-Ireland where Cork are being close to being practically written off, says Kevin O'Sullivan? Well, I actually think that they're, they're favourites for the game in my eyes, but it, certainly as far as the bookies are concerned, Limerick are raging hot favourites. Nine to two in a spot, I think Cork are, with, with one bookmaker, which is just like, that's, to me, that's just not accurate at all. Like, they're, they're five to two, nine to four shots at most, in my view. Yeah, uh, interesting comment from Brian McNamara. Lads, I think that Cork's view of, of Limerick as an inferior county is a real risk to their ability to beat them. Listening to The Rock clearly irks them that Limerick are viewed as favourites. Risky. I was there at the interview. I didn't think so. I think he did want to play up this notion that uh, Limerick, you know, you might as well hand them out the cup at this stage because you do always want to put the pressure on the opposition. Whether it amounts to anything on the field is another thing, but, you know, there is the perception. So that's what teams do. Just an interesting one as well. Um... There was a real, uh, you know, the the embrace between uh, Paul Canork and John Kiley after the beat Cork was, I, I definitely, it was definitely notable to me. They both uh, looked quite relieved. And I definitely do think there is a fear on the Limerick side of Cork uh, because they know what they can bring to the table. Interesting, Kiley said the other day, we were talking about, uh, you know, how fast Cork are. And he just kind of said, you know, he's never going to, say anything bad about his own players and just kind of said that we're no slouches either like so even the idea of Cork being a real fast team that's that's grand and they are a very fast team but you could see how another team would take exception to that almost so it's I just think I think it's set up it's teed up for an absolutely brilliant final and fairness to the rock smart enough uh being coy enough about it as well just basically heaping all the pressure on Limerick and that makes sense yeah, Dave, uh, Dave Bryant. Lads, Cody was hurling nothing in the same way Sean, Sean Boylan owed football nothing after 19 seasons with Mead. I thought he was there even longer. But, 23, uh, I thought. 23, I thought. Because I think Cody will eat. Did they ever recover? Yeah, yeah. Did they ever recover? Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, that was the big thing. A couple of people talking about dual players that could do it down the line. Jack Cahalan, Cork under 20, is doing dual at the moment, but Jay only under 21, says you and Cashman. Conor Callahan to go hurling. <laughs> There's an interesting one now. Yeah. Lahane 874 also says Jack Cahalan. How could The Rock complain that Limerick are favourites in all fairness? I don't think he was. Dahi Burke could do it. That's an interesting one. Could he go with the footballers? I think of them all. And John Crawford adds that in also. That's a good one now. That is they, a good one. There's Damien, a guy, th there's no doubt in his ability to go and do that, yeah. Yeah. Damien Callan is a very good footballer as well. Yeah. I, do you know what? It really annoyed me. And I think it was 2012 or 2013 that he was playing with the footballers and uh, Conor Coonan took him off like 10 seconds before half time. I just thought it like... If it's half time, don't take a player off like in injury time of the first half. It's kind of making, you know, a bit of an example of whatever way you want to look at it. I know managers feel like I have to make that decision now, but I have to say that that has always stuck with me because uh, whatever it is, people like taking a pop at Damien Cahalan, maybe because he's not the sweetest hurler or whatever, but I think he's become a very important part, part of this Cork hurling team. And there's part of me wondering, should he start the final? Because, um, you know, we're, we're nearly talking as if Owen Cadigan will start, but it might be Damien Cahalan. Mm. And in some ways, I think Damien Cahalan might be more suited to marking Seamus Flanagan than Rob Downey would. So I actually think it's not a done deal, that selection either. Um, just a, an addition here. Kevin O'Sullivan, tip Jewel County, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. I think Burns would be fine. Kylie said boot is just precautionary. Cotlin is some specimen to replace him if needed. Who's improved more since semi uh, Limerick or Cork? And who won that semi? No, it's all fair points there. A uh, couple more freestyle ver uh, football, Vernie. This isn't Rio de Janeiro football. Or, I don't know. He's trying to say it. there is a bit of a samba Brazil element to the after under twenty footballer. So ah, okay, okay. Here's a good question: Who is Kikeni's best player under thirty? I think uh, Parik Walsh, twenty nine year old. I'd say probably Parik Walsh or Owen Cody. Yeah, Adrian Mullen wouldn't be far off. I'd say either. Mm, yeah, I mean, and there's three good players to build your team around. Yeah, no, fair, they obviously fair, are fair already point, there. Yeah. Already, yeah. Like. Even Paddy Deegan is young as well. Like, they've, yeah, no, they, they have. It's just the, the same, uh, the same snipers like the Richie Hogan, Richie Power. These type of players just don't seem to be coming through. And someone commented on uh, on on Twitter there under the under the feed of the show, just saying the underage success just hasn't been the same. And that's that's just a fact. Like the Kilkenny underage success, uh, Cody hasn't had the same conveyor belt to. 
uh, work from that he had, you know, in the noughties and even in the early, you know, 2010s, 2013, 14, 15. You know, he just hasn't had the same conveyor belt. So yeah. it's only natural, really. Yeah. Uh, Billy B, Wexford job would be great for Shefflin or Brennan. And uh, Shefflin, of course, he's over Thomastown, Eddie Brennan's with Kula, So We haven't talked about that as well, Shane. Like, who's going to fill the Wexford post? There's not someone obvious, to me anyway, in Wexford to fill that post. So are they going to have to go outside again? And if so, you know, Derek McGrath, who's managing in Fay Harriers or coaching in Fay Harriers, does he potentially go in there? It's not exactly a million miles from from Waterford City. Um, just going to be really interesting over the next while. It's going to be all sorts of rumours and uh, yeah, I'm going to sit back and enjoy every bit of it. Yeah, there's some amount of comments flying in here. I would sacrifice by right room ball to have Jim <laughs> I had the comment put up before I read through it. So I have to read it now. I would sacrifice my right ball to have Dermot Connolly come back for a season with the Dublin Herders. I think that'd be interesting. And you know, actually, Eric Lowndes, I would like to see him with the Dublin Herders next year. Could be very good addition in there. And I'm not I think he's that... gone to Dubai, Shane, to take up a teaching post. Sure, bring him home. <laughs> Fly him home, yeah. I there are the, the dubs obviously will be like I don't know if Conor Costa is unlikely to ever play a senior hurling. Oh uh Kieran Kilkenny, these guys can obviously, but mm. they with one on, already under their belt, they obviously are halfway there if they did come back and switch codes, but I can't see it happening. Declan O'Keefe, from a Limerick point of view, losing Burns would be a significant blow, whereas losing Casey is not as much of a blow. Quaid, Finn, Morrissey, three halfbacks, Lynch, Galan, or key Limerick players. I don't know. I think Limerick, you know, actually, if you go through Cork, in some ways, like there are star players, if you shut them down, um, you, you go a long way towards beating them, in, to some degree. But Limerick, I think, really are some of their parts. Now, we'll talk about this an awful lot more next week. By the way, Rob Downey really uh, came of age in Crow Park on Sunday after getting a lot of abuse the year before, says you and Cashman. Uh, Mr. Verney, what about Mick Fenley going to Kilkenny? Awfully need him to stay. Uh, I don't see that happening that quickly. He actually hasn't committed to, to Offaly yet, but I'd be amazed if, if he left. But there's another guy serving his apprenticeship. Um, like, essentially, he does, like, that's I'm saying. It's the same as Cattle. It's the same as Matty Kenny. I'd say the end goal would be to manage his native county. And, you know, not inconceivable to think that that would happen at some stage. There's there's definitely, uh, DMC is rubbing in a small bit of salt in the wounds. He goes, welcome to your time in the great wilderness, Kilkenny. It's good for the soul. I believe, Shane, from what I understand, uh, that... You know, the Kilkenny underage system uh, was drying up somewhat and maybe uh, may have been a bit behind what Cork and Limerick and others were doing. But I do believe they've definitely moved to rectify that in the last, you know, year or 18 months. So, like, it doesn't take that look at Cork. Like, I think, I think I was reading a piece there today, Owen Cormack and the, the examiner had... Uh, you know, I think Charleville CBS were beaten 25 points by Ard Skull Reach in a Hearty Cup final. I think it was 10 years ago. And, you know, they kind of sensed that there was, you know, the Cork's underage success or their, you know, competitiveness was coming to an end. So they just, you know, totally revamped their underage system. Uh, Kevin O'Donovan, I believe, was one of the men kind of behind that. Like, look at look at them now, like, you know what I mean? Winning absolutely everything all around them. Things can turn quickly enough if you have the right people and the right structures in place. Yeah, as you know, I'm terrified of this Cork takeover, which I think is coming. <laughs> Every time Fintan O'Toole of the 42 tweets about Cork's latest underage success, I'm, I'm tweeting him hard about the Cork takeover that's coming. <laughs> It is almost here, and I'm terrified. Brian McNamara won't win Jewel, but Keith Higgins deserves a, a shout. Some man to turn out for the Mayo Herders when the easy thing would be to finish up. Nicky Racker Cup, a fitting tri tribute to a great GA man. I think we are, we're all delighted yeah. to see that. Shane Power, does Richie English come in, in at three and Dan Morrissey out to five if Dermot Burns is out, or does Colin Coughlin come straight in? We'll talk about that a little bit more next week. Who do you think will win the club all Ireland? Um, God, it's, it's so difficult to say at this juncture. Uh, we'll come back to that later on down the line. Michael O'Callaghan, when are you going to do your all-star all -star team so far? We'll probably do one on Monday, will we? Yeah, we'll do one Monday, and it'll be interesting to see uh, the difference the All-Ireland final will make in our selections as well. Like, it just go, It's going to be interesting to see. Like, yeah, a, lo a lot will depend on, you know, who wins. Like, if Cork, if Cork win, you know, you mightn't have that many Limerick lads on it. And the flip side of, you know, if Limerick wins, someone said to me yesterday, Limerick will win by 10 points minimum. I, I don't agree with that. But if they do, you know, it's going to be heavily, heavily, you know, there's going to be green green players everywhere, basically. Yeah. And let us know if you want us to do that uh, All-Star team on Monday, the early All-Stars 
I like putting our necks on the block and saying who we think it is and, you know, then being disproved later on. Or, you know, at least we put <laughs> our necks on the block. Hey, Isaac Dolan says, take Horgan out of it. Who is Cork's best player? Jack O'Connor? Mark Coleman? I mean, that's a tough one. Um, Robbie O'Flynn can be huge. Seamus Harnady. Do you know, like sometimes when, when, when they're under pressure, Harnady's the man for it. Uh, we do want to talk about speedsters, so we're going to come back to Jack O'Connor in a minute, but that's a serious question. Get your comments in there. A brilliant question. Uh, a plus for Cork this year is Fitzgibbon not playing to his high level and it not affecting the team. Yeah. Fact, yeah, he went off, came back on, and did he end up getting a couple of points he in? He got a point anyway, play? yeah. He got a point, yeah. yeah. Uh, any more questions? Will we move on to the speedsters? There's plenty, yeah, yeah. huge amount of comments coming in here. But uh, yesterday I decided to put up a poll. I think it was actually your idea. I like taking credit for your ideas, and you like taking credit for mine. So I will yeah. take no credit for any of your ideas. The amount of times we had a chat beforehand, we tee up, we'll talk about this on the show, and you end up stealing my point. <laughs> it's, it's fairly disgraceful. But we did a poll yesterday. Who was the fastest hurler of all time? Jack O'Connor, John Milan, DJ Carey, or Lara Corbett. So 38.6%. Now, the, the poll is still live there on at our game HQ if you want to follow it on Twitter. 38.6% for Jack O'Connor. John Milan, strangely, 12.1%. And as you know, <laughs> having, having tried to chase after him and watch his arse getting smaller and smaller as he moves off into the distance, he's faster than 12%. John he's Milan a... is that fast that I couldn't even hold on to his jersey. Like. <laughs> DJ Carey, 26.9%. And Larry Corbett, 22.3%. Can I ask you, Shane? Can I ask yeah. you who you voted oh, yeah. for? Uh, Jack O'Connor. I voted for DJ. I think Jack O'Connor is ridiculously fast, unfairly fast. He shouldn't be allowed to run. He's that fast. Yeah. Uh, DJ, I, yeah. Think about DJ Carey. Is, I wonder, like, all right, so if you, the strength and conditioning and all that, the athletic There you go. Is, there you go. There you all, go. All that stuff is different now. So DJ Carey was lightning. And when he got the ball and turned, the entire stadium and even people at home all of a sudden went, you know, because you were just about, what's this lad about to do? Is there an element to that with Jack O'Connor now? He gets the ball on the wing. You're thinking, this lad's kicking for home here. He wants to run in the byline and try and finish it into the roof of the net or whatever. The byline. Uh, you're watching a lot of soccer, Chief. End you're line, watching way too much soccer. And and I've never shied away from that. I do <laughs> like soccer. And I'll never know. Um, but I, I think he's up there with the fastest. Like, who else? Let us know out there. Who else is, is some of the fastest? I think James Callan is obviously very fast. Uh, <laughs> Any excuse. Every show, just fast. anybody that was playing the drinking game, that's your first shot of this week's show. <laughs> no, that's a good one. Uh, what about Ben O'Connor? Jerry O'Connor wasn't. Nah, li- no, them two boys were lightning. Like they, those two boys were different gravy. It's funny you should mention those two as well. Their their Newtown Shandrum club mate to me was the fastest man that ever played inter county hurling. That's Cottle Nocton. The fastest I've ne- man ever to pull up a pair of togs. I've never I've never seen the like of him. He's the same as Jack O'Connor in that he doesn't have to run straight at you. He can just run. Remember Tommy Walsh saying um, with Jack with Jack O'Connor that he wouldn't try to run after him. He just tr- he try and run in a diagonal line and almost mm. cut off his run. Uh, he was so fast. Actually, tell you a good story. Actually, about, about Cotton Nocton. we played. Uh, we played Newtown with the Offaloon or Twenty Ones before. Oh, one of their All Ireland semi finals, and I was playing centre back. I'm not sure why, but uh, first things first, <laughs> Pat Mulcahy was running through, and I put up the hurl, and he walked through it and broke it. So I got a yellow card. That was grand. And then in the second half, Cotton knocked him was soloing in the end line. And he just gave a pass with his right hand and I just followed through with my shoulder now. I absolutely sicken him. Like doesn't matter how fit or how strong you are. If someone sickens you like that, like that's there's nothing you can do. It doesn't matter who you are. Yeah, especially so, against a tank like you. <laughs> so he was he was in bits on the ground. He was the, the, totally winded or whatever. And uh, Ben O'Connor, who I sub- subsequently interviewed a couple of times, <laughs> he was just hovering around the scene and the, the referee just said to me, he's like, off, off, get off, off, off. And Ben O'Connor comes over and he's just like, left man, boy, left man. I'd say I was going to be left into the middle of next week if I hadn't been taken off the pitch. But it was just funny and, and no, no, but like to see firsthand Nocton's pace, it was, as you say, about 10 years on, give him modern day speed training and modern day strength and conditioning. Like he was absurdly fast back then. So what would he be like now? Desi Hutchinson, shouldn't, shouldn't he be in the conversation? 
he probably should be in the conversation as well. As well, Shane, um, and he's not going to get as much credit because he's a defender, albeit one of the best defenders of all time. Uh, I've seen Brian Wheelan's pace up close, and even when he was touching 40, he was still faster over 10 or 15 yards than than anybody, really. Uh, so his pace... If you look at DJ Carey's goal in the 2000 in Ireland, a ball comes in, Niall Claffey drops it, DJ gets it on the run, and Brian Wheelan is literally catching him before he puts the ball in the net. But just uh, you know, absurdly fast as well. Yeah, Kyle Hayes is pretty quick. I'd say Michael Carey is pretty quick. I think uh, Tipperary underage James Devaney, JD is pretty quick. There's a lot of players like this that are serious pace. I'll just check the comments to see uh, to see who else is mentioned here. And let's see. Yeah, Ben and Jerry O'Connor. Yeah, and JD Devaney has savage pace. Has own and uh, obviously a lot of these players are watching their hurling closely. Uh, Kyle Hayes does fast Eddie not come into the oh by Jay does yeah. And just in case anybody doesn't know, obviously fast Eddie is a beautiful nickname. It's based on fast Eddie Eddie Felson from the film The Hustler. He was basically a hustler, and he's called Eddie Felson, and they call him fast Eddie because he potted the ball unbelievable quick. But Eddie was just yeah, like again. Just lightning pace. If he got the ball, you were goose, basically. Yeah. Um, so plenty of people are agreeing with you on the Colin Nocton. Not that anyone would disagree. Alan Cadigan can put on the afterburners, too. He certainly can. Uh, Connor Whelan has pace to burn. Yeah, definitely. Tom Kenny. Kevin, yeah. O'Sullivan, Kevin O'Sullivan says, I was the quickest getting so <laughs> <laughs> I've been there, Kevin. I've been there. Yeah, uh, Taloman GEA in football, the Wallaces of Mead Sprint Champions. They're yeah, uh, they're from Rat Oat, I believe. Never brought that, uh, you know, never fully used that. Did Vernie ever chase Leighton Gin- Glynn during his Wicklow time? I actually think I marked him one day. We were playing a challenge match against his club. No, I've interviewed him, but I've never chased him. He uh, he was finished hurling when I went to my brief. Um, my brief forgettable spell with the Wicklow with the Wicklow Hurlers. First name on the team sheet. Yeah, it's funny actually. T- you should talk about um the Wallaces. Uh, there was a fella playing for the Cork uh, Miners the other night, Timmy Wilkes. His parents are both from Poland, and I believe he's the under sixteen Ireland sprinting champion. So like that's like that's what Cork are bringing to the table. That pace. It's funny you talk about you know Jack O'Connor, you know Shane Kingston, all the Cork lads now. You go back through you know recent history. You look at Cotton Nocton, the two O'Connors, Tom Kenny. Like Jesus, they have a fair history of pace. In they probably, I, I go as far as saying they're probably the paciest county you now in history. I, I, I find it hard to name as many tip lads that were as fast as those kind of Cork, Cork lads, if you know what I mean. And then as well, and you brought it up beforehand, like Connor Lahan. Yeah, and, and that's mentioned in the comments uh, too. Conor Lahan was an ex- expensive luxury sports car that kept breaking down, had to go. Wow, actually, I thought when I clicked that firstly, I thought that was going to be a positive comment. Didn't realize uh, it was going to be negative. So uh, I'm sure plenty of people don't, don't don't necessarily agree with that. He did score an all uh, goal in an All Ireland final, played very well that day. Mark Corcoran, I know the fastest player, and you don't, Darren Sweetham, who not our Cork man, who was wasted with rugby. As I'm, yeah, as I'm yeah, sure. exactly, yeah. Yeah, uh, Kevin Broderick is mentioned here. Tom Kenny, very uh, fast. Kevin Broderick, I think, was fast, but I think it was more, uh, I think his, his skill kind of made him faster, if you know what I mean. Like he, his, his ability to do things with the ball, and obviously, there's speed of foot, but there's also speed of mind as well. We always we used to have a fella, uh, in Borough, Brian Hennessy was his name, and every time we were doing sprints, he used to always anticipate the whistle. And he'd be out to the comb before everybody else. He definitely wasn't the fastest, but his anticipation skills were the fastest. I have to say, it's a good little trick. Yeah, I'd yeah, be a yeah. Fan of it myself. Tommy yeah. Ryan has some pace. Yeah, of course. Tommy Ryan, who was uh, impact sub for Watford more often than not uh, over a couple of years there, his pace was, it was almost like silly fast. It was, it was like, yeah. you know, Lenny Henry type music or Benny Hill music going in the back. It was that fast. And I'm saying that as a positive thing. There's definitely no insult. It just looked ridiculously fast. Darrell Fitzgibbon mentioned, who was the slowest, uh, Bernie? <laughs> well, it's not you, but it's not you, man. That's full. <laughs> uh, Shane Long, of course. Conor Callahan, if he hurled for Dublin. Keen Lynch, Colin Dunford, Paddy Dirk in his name. The names keep flying in here. Jack Leahy as well. He's a great minor hurler. Yeah, he watched him score a few the other night. He is certainly a good one. My brother is mentioned here by Owen Ryan and uh, David Tierney is mentioned. So da- Actually, funny enough, David Tierney, uh, I have a friend over in China who watches the show every week from, from Shenzhen in China. And he said, China. David, yeah, China, <laughs> the Chinese virus, Chinese. Um, and he just, David Tierney was one that popped up for him as well. I, 
I, I don't know. I, I probably didn't see him enough. He was obviously brilliant in that 2001 All Ireland semi final. I probably didn't see him enough, but he did look, you know, very athletic or whatever. But it's funny, like, we we're going to have this conversation more and more. And I was only thinking about it, like, what clubs are doing now. All the skill work in clubs, hugely important, massively important. Don't get me wrong. But speed is nearly a prerequisite now to play GEA. And you will not play inter county. I would go as far as saying, that if you uh, you know do not have a good level of speed or a good level of pace over the next ten years, you will could be ruled out of inter county GA. That's just the way it is, like. Yeah, no, it's true. And like I, even I remember a couple of years ago, uh, Kilkenny running a course. I'm pretty sure it was like a, a speed training course, and but I just can't quite remember if it was to bring in young players so that they could get exposed to it, or if it was to sort of train up coaches to do it. I just can't remember which one it was, but I know they were advertising about it. So the likes of Kilkenny very much know it's going in this direction and have been moving on that for a couple of years. Uh, James Ryle had great pace, says Talaman G. I remember him catching one of the cork forwards and thinking, Jesus. Yeah, players do surprise you at times with their pace. It's funny, that one. Um, I remember some of the Kilkenny lads talking about that and they could not understand how James Ryle got back. I think it was on Jerry O'Connor, I think. I think it was Jerry O'Connor, the flick in the in the 06 final. But there's sometimes where lads are on their game. And when you're actually tuned in and feeling great, you can catch lads that you normally would never catch. Or as they say, anybody that's watching in Offaly, as they say up in up in Sir Kieran, up in Clarine, it's not catch, it's cat. You don't you don't catch someone, you catch them or you catch the ball. <laughs> right. Okay, we're gonna move on in a minute, but uh just a reminder we're brought to you by Torpu and, and Torpy and the Bamboo Hurley, little mispronunciation there. And a reminder that if you want to get audio podcasts, go to patreon.com forward slash our game. Five or a month there, support the channel and help us grow and uh we'll keep bringing more good t- content to you. Shawnee McGraw was fast, so was Joe Dean. Plenty of comments, keep them coming in. Absolutely love to see them. It's cart lads everywhere though. What's it? Yeah. Like it is. It's li- they're literally everywhere. There's something in the water down there, whatever it is. Uh, but still not. No All Ireland's in 16 years, which is obviously <laughs> tough for us all to see. Uh, <laughs> I'd say keep say I'd say keep saying that because I think you know it's only a matter of time before you it's going to be saying no All Ireland's in nine months or something like that. Yeah. That's the way it'll uh, be. I, th- I think that's going to be over very very soon. We actually quickly wanted to talk about some of the brothers involved in hurling at the moment, like Peter and, and Mike Casey. Both of them might miss the final. Mike Casey obviously did his cruise last year and he jarred his knee recently. Uh, John Kiley had said at the time that it wasn't related to the cruise yet, so hopefully he's fine. Brilliant full back and would be starting in pretty much any county and may well have been starting if he was fit throughout the year here. Peter Casey may miss the final. Then there's the two Cadigans you've mentioned there before the All-Ireland semi-final versus their feelings afterwards. Then who else are the great uh, great brothers that are left playing out there? An interesting style show to the final is that Richie English and Dara Fitzgibbon are cousins. They've come up against each other before and there's that famous photo of them sewing it into each other and uh, you know maybe they'll come up against each other again. Then there's like, obviously there's the Mahers and Tipperary, Potty and Ronan are still there. The three McGrath brothers, you've got the Mannions in Galway, you've got the three Bennets in Waterford. So there's plenty of good brothers out there. And I think, um, was it the Sydney Rabbitohs that Russell Crowe, the film, uh, the uh, Hollywood actor was involved with? And he says, you build a team around brothers. Yeah, it's a fair it's a fair point. I'd actually yeah. love to pose the question to people who they think are, you know, the best brothers in the history of the GAA. Um, well, people are already coming in uh, with the comments and uh, let's see who they are here. Are Keen and uh, Con and Keen O'Callaghan brothers? They are indeed. Um, so obviously they're two very good brothers at inter-county level. The Morrissey's Tom yeah. and Dan, both of them having very good, uh, very good seasons. Uh, Sean Oaks, Tanta and Izaki. Ben and Jerry. So, I mean, lots of people straight in with the comments on that. We're not shy with it. Hey, the Lohans, says Patrick yeah. Kiki, a regular I, Claire commenter. I love the fact that you can just say Ben and Jerry and everybody knows you're either talking about ice cream or you're talking about the two boys from Cork. <laughs> uh, the Bonner <laughs> brothers, the Dooleys, the Doyles, the Rackers. The wh- yeah, the Whelans. Yeah, like there's... Like, you the do Stapletons. Be, yeah. <laughs> the, the two Stapletons playing in Tipperary and Dublin. <laughs> ah, did it all right, did it all right. <laughs> so keep the comments coming in uh, we want to talk now about players one there. second now I'd say there's still look it up look at the comments uh, in I'd say there's still an element of happiness in you albeit you weren't happy at the time I'm not saying you were happy but there's a, de- a definitely an element of smugness in you that you have an All-Ireland Club medal and that your brother Paddy doesn't you have two actually and I'm going to say two before you get to say two <laughs> look move on from that I don't like talking about any of that stuff you know I'm 
far too humble. Isn't this what all the, the top teams always say? You wouldn't believe the humility in our dressing room. These guys are so humble. So I'm not even going to go down there. What you usually do is you'll say, yeah, I have two all Ireland medals, but I hate talking about it. And <laughs> it's basically whatever the opposite of humility is. <laughs> <laughs> you get nothing out of me. <laughs> hey, look, we wanted to talk about players in their 30s who are still involved. And, and who are the players? That, you know, I mean, this has obviously been very topical in recent weeks, even last weekend. Kevin Moran is the only person involved, I think, with the Watford setup. Well, Shane Fives also. Shane Fives did get on the on the field. He's 32 years of age. Kevin Moran, he's 34, 35, uh, that neck of the woods. He wasn't brought on. It is definitely getting rarer and rarer that we've seen it. And it's like, you know, do you remember a couple of years ago when you had the likes of Brick Walsh, 35, 36, playing in All-Ireland semi-finals? Whereas now it's it's just there's there's far less of it. We'll go through a lot of the players that we see still involved, but it's it's a tougher place to be. Yeah, it's getting a lot harder uh, at that age. There's no doubt about it. And I just wonder, Shane, are, we're, we've actually put together you know a sizable enough list of guys in their thirties. But I wonder, I, I wonder, like in ten years' time, will that will will that list still have you know that amount of names? Will strength and conditioning mean that lads can go for longer? Or will how fast the game has gone mean that when lads turn 28, 29, 30 and they maybe lose a bit, a yard of pace or something like that, that they're going to have to go, maybe not at that age, but definitely at, I'd say from probably 32 onwards, I would say, is when you probably start struggling or maybe lose that bit of pace. So I wonder, Hurlan, I, I was actually chatting with one of the boys at training about this last night, like will Hurlan ever get slow again? Once it gets fast, like it's never going to get slow, like it's never going to get... You know, the Mulligan is gone at, you know, senior level. And it's even, like, junior teams all around the country trying to play that senior style, a lot of them, and trying to move the ball a lot better and use a bit more pace to it. So, Hurling's only going to get faster. So, I think it's going to be harder for guys in their, you know, early to mid-30s to be still playing at inter-county level. Even club level, it gets it's harder at our age. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And the rules are definitely uh, leaning towards faster players. So that is certainly the way it, it's moving. I, I definitely agree with you there. Uh, Tony Brown, didn't he play for for, Cor or for Waterford at 40? I think he was 40, yeah. He's yeah. like, that's that's just on a different level completely, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Plenty of people talking about different brothers. Dan and Tom Morris, he mentioned again. The Mahonies mentioned, uh, Philip and Park, of course. The Coonies in Galway, the Mackies mentioned again. Is the game a better spe spectacle this way? Uh, it's hard, <laughs> It's hard to kind of say, isn't it? Like, you still love the... I still love that. But that's why I kind of really like watching club hurling because you still have the element of old school to it. But, th like, the skill level is a county level. I think it was uh, Joe Canning said in an interview with you there recently enough, you know, people uh, almost, you know, given out about points being scored from an incredible distance. But, like, it is an incredible skill. And there are only, like... You are only, like, Joe Canning's and a few more that can do it. Not everybody can do it. So, like, our game has definitely become more skillful in, in recent years. So, I, I think that's probably to be admired, in fairness, too. Yeah. Plenty more comments coming in here. The Cannings are some family. Yeah. Obviously, Ollie and, Ollie and Joe makes sense. Joe and Kelly played uh, well into his 30s for Offaly until 1993. Pat Horgan is a beast of a man uh, for 33. A few, so, just a few of the players. We're just going through some of the Liam McCarthy-level teams here. And you can let us know who we're leaving out here, because we undoubtedly are. So, Neil McManus with Antrim. John Conlon with Clare. Patrick Horgan and Owen Cadigan with Cork, Alan Nolan, David Tracy with Dublin, Kilkenny, TJ Reid, Richie Hogan, Connor Fogarty, Wally Walsh, Owen Murphy, Nicky Quaid with Limerick, Tipperary, Paddy Maher, Noel McGrath, James Callan, Watford, Kevin Moran and Shane Fives, and Wexford, Mark Fanning. So there's definitely going to be a couple more in there, but um, yeah, like I just wonder how many teams are going to start with more than one, you know, as a going concern, unless, unless there's like at, at professional sports, Players playing into their early and mid 30s is nothing surprising. It's nothing new. They're all at it. As I said to you before, a third of the captains at the Euro 2020s, they were 35 or older. Yeah. I mean, that gives you a fair indication. So it's so does that mean now that maybe inter county teams or players themselves are going to have to think, what are these players doing in professional sports that I can maybe mimic? But maybe a lot of it comes down to the amount of rest time and the fact that these like top players at professional sports can sit around all day, get massaged every day, can do whatever stretching required, have all the expertise in the world. So maybe it's maybe it's unattainable for players and, you know, that people over 30 are generally going to be weeded out. Yeah, well, like me or you don't exactly know what's going on behind the scenes in, in counties and county squads, but 
from like anecdotal evidence of what's going on in club squads, it, it is still not accepted in club, some clubs and some managements don't accept like older players doing less. And that's just a fact of life. Like older players do have to do less. If you want them on the pitch for, for match day, they're going to have to train less. They're going to have to train a lot smarter. I'm not sure if that's acceptable at inter-county level where nearly everyone has to do everything almost. So I don't, like, I, I, I find it hard to see too many counties making exceptions for lads. And I think when an older player is doing less at inter-county level, that might be viewed as, you know, almost like that he's not able to keep up. And I don't think that's the case, but I'd love to, I might, the next time we're chatting to any sort of players in their early 30s, I'd love to go to find out whether they're actually doing less or their managements are being, you know, like, look, like, look at someone like, uh, Ledley King or Paul McGrath, who were only able to train very minimally with, you know, Spurs and would say Villa respectively, but their managers were able, wanted them on the pitch and knew what they could offer on the pitch. But they were there were extreme cases in that they were going to train very little. So I wonder, is that acceptable at county level at the moment? I I, I kind of would hazard a guess and say that's probably not. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that is true. But like I know with with Tipperary, like uh, Lara Corbett, it would often be the case of look. Lads, I think this was after the 2010 All Ireland semi final against Waterford that you know they were brought into the you know one of the you know the dressing rooms or just off the dressing rooms where maybe the Astro is, and uh, you know it was this big chat. Now I think Keane O'Neill might have led it where you know, he was a coach at the time, physical coach, and he was like, "Look, lads, we're going to train so hard now for the next three or four weeks," and uh, except you, Lar, <laughs> and apparently <laughs> a laugh on, so. but you know he was the sort of lad he just had to have his body right, put him out there, and let him bang in the goals against Kilkenny. So wasn't that it? Yeah, uh, stop. Yeah. <laughs> that 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 is the case, though, and that's becoming more the case at club level now. Yeah. Okay. So just back to the the poll about the fastest hurlers. Like, do, do you think Jack O'Connor is the fastest in the game right now? I mean, even it, it's so interesting that point about Connor Lahan that was mentioned earlier. That Corker team all about speed. Connor Lahan is speed, and apparently he's an unbelievable nick at the moment. Uh, with what? Uh, sorry, with Middleton as well. It's just interesting that they couldn't find a way to marry the two because he just seems so set for his style. But maybe maybe it's just the interplay it just didn't work for him because like some lads get the ball and all they see is the posts and, and trying to make something happen. So maybe it just he didn't fit into the system. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um at his best, you know, phenomenal player. But we probably just didn't see it enough, realistically. You yeah, know, a bit inconsistent. Yeah, a bit inconsistent. And uh, a point that Ben O'Connor made last year, just saying that you know maybe lads taking their points. The, I think the not saying that lads taking their points maybe rather than going in and forcing the goal option. That's not to say that he always did that because he definitely got in for some goals as well when he was in that place. But his first instinct probably was to shoot, whereas a lot of players now their first instinct is look up and see is there a goal on is there you know a chance of getting into a really really um high scoring area um but yeah penny for his kind of thoughts kind of watching from afar now this year yeah i think uh for for right now it has to be jack o'connor for think, right now jack o'connor of all time i do think Colin nocton was the fastest he'd be, it, yeah do yeah, you remember I, that do you remember that episode of the simpsons they were at the dog track and it was just there was one dog called she's the fastest <laughs> just in that, I'd, I'd say Carl Nocton is he's the fastest was it the all ireland semi-final or quarter-final uh, 2005 or 6 where he came on and scored a crucial goal and yeah. in the headline of the star was knockout <laughs> so, yeah beautiful yeah did that very well mossy Lyons says differentiated training is a big thing o'grady did it with cork in team in the mid 2000s said how could you have brian uh corker doing the same running program as sean ogo halpine which is so true it totally so makes true. sense but there's a lot of there's a lot of pig ignorance amongst uh particularly old school managers in the ga now and if you can't do the training they'd almost be you know they just think that th it's the opposite of a one for all approach i'm chatting guys involved in the leinster rugby setup as well like a lot of the older players will never do more than 70 percent of the training like mm. never because it's just like johnny sexton his training is completely tailored and anybody that has any knocks or can't do particular things the ga is slowly getting there but mm. it's uh, probably a slow enough transition yeah and it won't be everyone doing it all at once either no you know? that's definitely the case um if players are getting faster uh, sorry if players are getting faster are you selected for players that respond less to volume training thinking of michael owen uh 
maybe the train and hurt his career. Yeah, I mean, you have to be very careful with players because you can you can spoil and ruin players and have them out for years. Uh, you Something you wanted to talk about was the build-up for an All-Ireland. So Limerick are used to this. They've, they've done it for a couple of years now. And even outside of that, they've been, you know, playing league finals, obviously a number of Munster finals. So to them, this routine, they've been down this road before. It won't take a funk out of them. I'd say it's, look, lads, we'll go, we'll do a job, in, out, and that's it. Uh, whereas for Cork, yes, they got to... They've played in some semi-finals and they've tasted defeat in recent times. They have won monsters, but they're back into this final. Maybe seven or eight of their players, as the Rock said last week after the win over Kilkenny, it was probably their first time playing a championship at Croke Park, so they weren't used to it. What sort of pitfalls do you think players face in the lead up to an All Ireland? Uh, I'd say in a normal year, very hard to avoid all the conversation, all the the usual. Con- will will he start? Will he won't he start? Are you looking forward to this? Who are you going to be marking? Who's going to be marking Keen Lynch? Who's going to be marking this and that? Uh, what are we doing after? What are the celebrate? You know all that crack that you don't want to get you know embroiled in, but it's very very easy to. I think it's an awful lot easier to shelter yourself from that now. Like COVID in many ways is, and COVID and face masks are a great excuse. To, to not talk to people and with the face mask even for people maybe not to recognise you as much but I would say that would probably make it easier for a lot of the Cork lads it's funny enough I was only kind of thinking as well um, like this is a new Cork team I wonder how many of them are that recognisable with their helmets off outside of Cork like I, I, I'd be straight with you I, I wouldn't be 100% trying to recognise uh, Patrick Collins Sean O'Donoghue Niall O'Leary probably recognise Jack O'Connor uh, a couple more just that they're but I'm sure they're well known around Cork that's just a kind of a, an aside point um, they're obviously having to deal with tickets that obviously less tickets but that might make it harder because there might be more people looking for less so there's a lot of those things that can kind of happen and I remember uh was it Eddie Brennan saying that he used to he used to try he used to often work the day before the All Ireland final and sometimes at Electric Picnic if that was on that weekend and I suppose that was uh, experience brought that that he just wanted to be busy the day before and he'd be totally invisible at Electric Picnic you know <laughs> people have enough things going on at something like that the last thing to do the last thing they want to be doing is talking about hurling the last thing they have any interest in um, and Noel Hickey used to go farming where uh, whereas you know. Uh, that they could do that because they had the experience of winning All Ireland. The Cork lads don't have that experience, maybe don't have that confidence. So they're probably uh, crossing the T's and dotting the I's a bit more, and you know, double checking their gear bag and making sure that they have everything ready because this is a ho- totally new experience for them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I think the likes of Kieran Kingston, you know, he's got plenty of experience. The Rock has been in several All Ireland finals. Don Low Grady's involved there. He's managed teams in all Ireland finals. Jared Cunningham. There's obviously other experience in the background team too. This shouldn't really be a pitfall for them, but it's more what happens in your own mind, isn't it? Uh, of how you psych yourself out. Will some of these players start overthinking things? Will they start, you know, for like there are some players who are able to switch off and it's great, and they probably won't think about it too much until the match uh, itself happens. But like you can kind of have yourself. Yeah, like you were saying there about Eddie Brennan, I remember the, the morning of the Club All-Ireland in 2018, I said to myself, just to put down a bit of time, because it was it was an evening game, which is annoying. You know, you want it on nice and early, get your sleep done, get through the routine of eating something, uh, then sort of build towards going to the match, and then you're out of there, and everything takes care of itself. But like a bit more of a later match, you've just so much, t- you like you've dead hours that you have to kill. And I remember going for a walk, and I ended up walking probably, a nice bit up the canal and back down then and I was like, and I looked at my phone at the amount of steps done and I was like, geez, that's an awful lot of steps done for this time of the day. <laughs> so yeah, you kind yeah. Of, like, and, I, and I was never so tired at the end of the match, even though I came on before half time. I was never as tired at the end of the game as I was there. So I'd say a lot of it was nervous energy for the day, obviously forgetting my boots freaked myself out as well. We were down in Port Leash and I didn't have the right boots. <laughs> and then even that walk as well. So everything possible I did to probably psych myself out. But like, you, you can see, you still get through it, but like, those sort of things can be a factor. No, it's very psych, yeah. Psych yourself out. It's very easily done. Um, I remember uh, Brian Mullins, who hurled and goals for Burr, uh, he said he used to suffer bad with nerves, and I think he let in three goals in Leinster minor final against Kilkenny, and, and a really wet day. I think it could have been ninety five actually. I could be wrong. In around in around that mid nineties, and he essentially said he never psyched himself out again. He'd be psyched up, but he wouldn't be psyched out. Sometimes you need to make a, a mistake or do it wrong to learn from those lessons. I remember we played Kilkenny in the Leinster minor semi-final in 04, I think it was. 
and I had done the leaving cert a couple of weeks before that and was ill prepared for leaving cert and couldn't sleep any of the nights before the exams because they just hadn't enough done and ended up losing about stone weight I'd say and we played Kilkenny about a week after and uh I remember I knew I was going to be marking Richie Hogan and uh, I totally psyched myself out. I just like before the game was hardly able to talk. It was just like this, you know, this game is going to define my life and this kind this kind of bullshit like that you get totally wrapped up in a minor semi-final. And I just like, he made an absolute clown on me. There was one stage where he threw that dummy hand pass and I went the wrong way and he hit the ball. The goalkeeper actually went the wrong way as well and he hit the ball into an open goal. And uh, sometimes you need to do it all wrong. Uh, at some stage that that's why minor and under 20 and all these things are great you need to do things wrong to learn those lessons but i'd imagine the you know the build up to the under 21 final the build up to the under 20 final will stand to a lot of these cork lads um i'm even kind of nervous even thinking about it here now i can't can't wait for next week to come around uh so many things to discuss about the match but uh the build up will be key for those cork players in particular yeah, and that's something we'll go into in far more detail next week. Anything else that we haven't touched on for today before we before we go? I mean, there's obviously a Westmead vacancy now. Shane O'Brien is gone. Fintan O'Connor is gone from Kerry. So there, there's so much that's going to happen in the next while, and I think we're going to see plenty of retirements as well. Yeah, like we often talk about silly season in the in the winter, like but like silly season is here and the championship is still on. Like there's so many interesting things going to happen over the next while. Yeah, okay. So that's it for the Hurling Show for today, brought to you by Bamboo. We'll be back again on Monday morning, so get your comments in and your questions and whatever you'd like us to talk about, and we'll do more business then. Thanks very much, Michael. Cheers, Chet. The Hurling Show, brought to you in association with Torpy. Torpy are leading hurling into a new future with Bamboo, a revolutionary hurley created using their unique engineered hurling performance know-how. Already being used by many inter-county players, Torpy's Bamboo is highly sustainable, offers players greater striking distance and a more consistent balance every time without compromising on natural feel. Check them out on the Torpy website and in the link below and enter the promo code OURGAME to get yourself 10% off.